Good day, everybody. Um, I'd like to thank everyone online for joining us uh, for this uh, lunchtime webinar. It's the second in our series being uh, given to us by Ian. Uh, I'd maybe like to just start um, by acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which we all meet here today in our various places and acknowledge my contribution, uh, their contribution to land. Uh, and I'd also like to acknowledge um, our elders past, present and emerging. Ian, thank you for joining us for the second in the series. Um, today we'll be looking at understanding how the brain works, including memory creation, access and retrieval. And in that way, I think what you've worked out during your many years in this field is that actually, actually impacts how children behave. Yeah. Um, and so we'll learn a little bit more about that. Um, but I think what I'd like to do, because we've obviously got more people online today, which is wonderful, uh, but there might have been some GPs or primary care physicians who ha actually have missed our first in the series, which was all around history taken in examination, specifically on this um, cohort of our patient group. Uh, and I wondered if you would, wouldn't mind just recapping uh, on that, and I might, I might take a seat uh, across from you now, but um, we'll then move on to the second session. And uh, once again, if there's any questions during the session, please put it into chat. Uh, we've, everyone's on mute at the moment, but you're welcome to interact uh, via the chat function. And uh, yeah, I'll hand over to you, Ian. Well, thank you, Tanisha, and uh, good lunchtime to everybody. Um, well, last time we spoke about taking an effective history because this really matters for children presenting with behavioural things. Usually there are quite long-term things behind it. But put it simply, you want to be very sure, is there a medical problem affecting this child's behaviour? And that'll probably be around airways, breathing at night, sleep, bowel function, rather than more remote conditions. And of course you might consider genetics within that. Then we would be wanting to have a good developmental history, looking at all the phases of development, and that's available on the previous video. And then finally, we'd want to be looking at what are the social emotional ingredients that might be affecting this child's behavior. So moving on from there today, um, today I thought we would focus on the general rules that control a child's behavior and thereby the sort of things that you could do about it. This is the sort of information I would have really enjoyed having as a parent. And I might even enjoyed it have, if I'd been taught it during medicine at some stage. Um, I think if you understand this, it helps greatly in dealing with families who are having difficulties managing their children. Today we'll focus on the general rules that affect behaviour, and in the next um, seminar we'll be looking more at what kind of specialist things might we be doing in terms of children with particular developmental or medical differences. So, in general terms then, what we want to know is uh, how do we manage children's behaviour? You know, where is the instruction manual? I mean, I've been asking people for a long time and I haven't met a single person yet who's got any kind of instruction manual when their children are born. So, in talking about behaviour modification, we're going to talk about three phases of it. The first phase is, what would be the best way to react to something a child says and does so that you get the best result? We tend to do that first because it's what people tend to focus on. What am I supposed to do, etc. More important, though, is how to be proactive so that you prevent difficulties happening in the first place. And then thirdly, we'd want to be knowing about, well, how do children develop an ability to control their own emotions? How do they develop the skills needed to create and maintain friendships? So let's start now with reactive. So in this we need to think about a fairly basic idea about the way the brain works. You know, the brain is just a bunch of electric circuits. Now they do everything. So some of them are complex, some of them are simple, but they're just a bunch of electric circuits. Um, a good number of them were present at birth, governing behaviours and, and even until the end of life, because some things may emerge under stress that you've never been called on to show before. Um, so roughly half of the circuitry in your brain was present already at birth, and that's what we call your personality. Now the other half gets there by you observing things you see around you and copying them and then seeing what the reaction to that is. And 
We'll focus on that since we can't really do much about the permanent circuits that develop your personality, although we can modify the degree of expression they show us. So, so let's just look at a couple of situations. Let's take a child who's doing something that rather they didn't. And if we're to think about these electric circuits, they only have one way they function. If a child says something or does something and you look at them or you touch them or you talk to them, then their brain will automatically note that reaction and strengthen that memory. So that memory is more likely to be brought into play again. In other words, it's reinforced. So now a child's doing something they shouldn't and we're thinking to ourselves, well, how do I manage this so I don't give the, any reaction to it, so I don't reinforce this circuit? Well, okay, let's just not look and let's not say anything. What do you think the child will do? Huh, you're right. They'll double it because you don't seem to be noticing. And what if you don't notice that? Then they'll treble it, then quadruple it. And then they might start to throw, kick and punch to make sure that you are interested in what they're saying or doing. Well, how are we supposed to manage this if we react to it and it makes it worse? Because it strengthens the memory of it. Well, we have a way of dealing with that. Let's divide this storm into four categories. Let's have a category one, a category two, category three, a category four. So in a category one thing that you don't like, this is where a child is doing something that you find a bit annoying, but you actually feel quite okay. And this is probably the majority of negative things that children do. Well, in this situation, obviously, we can just pay no attention to it. Don't look, don't touch, don't speak, just let it go. And then it's more likely to stop and not be recur because you've not reinforced it. All right, well, let's gun it up a little bit now. Child's doing something, and you're saying to yourself, if they don't stop doing that, I'm going to kill them. So in other words, you're now well out of sorts. And we need to do something about that and yet not reinforce it. So what could we do? We could just walk out on it. Because for a category two storm, we are assuming there is no significant danger to the child or to anybody else. So where there is no danger, we walk out without a word, without making eye contact, without touching, just walk out. Making sure the child can't follow you because if you let the child follow you, then that's undermining the whole game, isn't it? So you might find a, a quiet place in your room or a quiet place outside or go and have a cup of tea or something. Well, let's now introduce a bit of danger. So let's say now there is a danger. So this is the, the danger phase, these next two. And there's two kinds of danger. There's a danger you can remove and a danger you can't remove. So if the child's doing something that is a risk, but you can remove the risk. So the cat's on fire, you can put the fire out and rescue the cat. You know, a child's climbing, you can remove the thing they're climbing on. They're running out onto the street, you can put a lock on the gate. So we, these are things where we can block that behavior, but still without eye contact, without words, and without touch as, as far as is possible, because we don't wish that behavior to be reinforced. So this is where We need to do something and firstly we're going to do it in a way that just removes the danger. Well what if you can't remove the danger? You know, your child's setting teeth into your neighbor's child, something like that. Well in this situation we probably need to get the child to somewhere safe. Now the idea of using a time out space, because that's what this is, is that this is a training exercise in showing the child what they should do when they have strong emotions that present a risk. They should back off and sort themselves out. As long as it's somewhere safe, and preferably there are things there that help the child to, re re to relax. So you might, some children like to crawl into cardboard boxes, some crawl under the bed, some wrap themselves up in dunas, others go out and bounce on the trampoline. As long as where they are is safe, that's fine. So that's a training exercise, not a punishment. So we're training them to deal with their own emotions. Once it's all over and they're back inside, we would carry on as though nothing had happened. We'd never talk about it 
because doing that will just bring the child's mind back to it and reinforce the whole problem when, that went wrong. So in terms of storms, we have a four-phase response that most parents I've met are able to deal with, though it depends a bit on their own mood at the time. And you have to recognise your own mood to know when you should act in, that, in those phases. So that's when the child's doing something good rather they didn't. Let's look at another really quite interesting reaction. Now, let's have a child doing something we, we quite like them doing. And I say to Danusha, lovely drawing you've done there. And she scribbles up and says, no, it's not, it's rubbish. Like that and throws it on the ground and think, well, what on earth is that about? Or, or I say, now come and do this thing because I know that you're good at it. And you say, I can't always get it wrong. I'm no good at anything like that. Well, you think, what on earth's going on here? Well, let's just look at the brain here. There's a brain. And what's happening is the brain saying, doing that thing well is working well, but I bet if I do it this way, it'll work better. And it's just like turning on a, turning on a switch, isn't it? So what's the brain saying? That works well, but I bet that'll work better. So in the switch, the child is trying to find out whether you are more interested in them getting it right and doing it well, or are you more interested in them presenting themselves to you as a failure? Because that what, that's what's happening there. Look what a failure I am. And as soon as you start talking, you're going to reinforce that notion of, yes, I'm a failure. Now, there are particular people who are very prone to these switches. I mean. You all do it, I know. I find myself doing it from time to time, but there are particular people who are very prone to them. And that includes children of low self-esteem. And that low self-esteem might be because of learning difficulties, it might be because of social emotional difficulties, or it might be associated with one of the neurodevelopmental disorders, for example, within the autism spectrum. And especially in what we call Asperger disorder, we find these switches are happening very regularly. So what should we do then about these switches? Well, the first thing to say is what you did there by responding and saying that's good was absolutely correct because you're reinforcing that success that the child's had there. So in this case, we rush in. And when the child brings the switch in, then we rush out. No eye contact because that's a strong reinforcer. No words, no touch. In other words, more or less, get a life. You know. So, and what do you imagine will happen then? I bet some of you are picking this up. Well, the child will then test us with a storm to see if we're seriously not interested in this switch. So I say, uh, you know, Danusha says that's rubbish. And I look back and I say, lovely weather we're having, isn't it? Showing that I'm not interested in it. And then she'll say, oh, you don't care about me. You only care about my brother. And so she'll bring in that bit of a storm to see if I can be drawn back into it. But what we say to parents is stick to your guns. You have done what's needed. You have strengthened the behavior you want. You've pointed out why, and that's the end of your duty in that case. So in terms of reactivity, we've talked about two common human behaviours, and they affect adults as well. Firstly, storming, and that's manageable in the four-phase approach that we talked about. And secondly, switching, which is a very important thing not to get involved with. Because when we get involved in it, we cause a massive increase in anxiety. We cause people who self-esteem to drop even further because we're reinforcing their failures and we cause more what we call failure behaviours to occur, i.e. getting something wrong when they're perfectly able to get it right. Well, let's move from that now and let's move on to proactive things that we could be doing because this is actually rather more important, isn't it, to have an environment where the child is more likely to succeed by the way we're behaving. So in being proactive, One of the first things we might consider is the way we make messages. That is, we make demands or we provide information, something along that line. And the, it, it should contain three important characteristics. Firstly, what you're demanding should be reasonable for that child's ability and the state of the art state of the world just at this moment. It should be reasonable for their developmental ability. The next is it well understood.
Now, while making sure that your demand is reasonable and clear, being sure that's well understood is not quite as easy. Now, if, I'm, if I'm to be sure that someone's well understood, then I have to be sure that they're listening before I pass my message. It's pointless giving a message to somebody who's not listening. So in order to be, to be well understood, we need a number of things to be, to be occurring. So firstly, we could use an occupational therapy designed sensory blocker. That is, I'm blocking your ability to think at the moment. And Tanush, can I borrow you for just a moment? And um, uh, I'm going to now make a demand of Tanusha using these characteristics. Mm -hmm. So Tanusha, I'm coming at her from the front, mm -hmm. and I'm looking strong into her eyes now, so I'm preventing her from being able to think. Um, if I'm too close, then that's too confronting, and that won't work. So I've got to be the standard distance. So I'm coming at her from the front, Tanusha. She knows I'm going to say something. Mm -hmm. And now I need to make my message very clear. So that's the next phase of this, the clarity. Tidy your bedroom now. Mm -hmm. So I'm not offering her a choice because if I say, would you or could you, that, and she says no, well, she's right, isn't she? She doesn't want to, <laughs> but that's not what we're trying to do. We're trying to get something achieved. So we need to say, do this thing. We would use please if we knew the child was going to do it. Otherwise we would not use it. Otherwise it's, an, it's up for negotiation. So doing that things now, so the words have come through clearly yep. and I'm not providing any alternative, though I could provide a bit of a face saver. For example, tidy your room now, do you want me to help to start with? Or come to tea now, do you want to start with your drink or with your food? Mm -hmm. So you can provide a little sort of empowering suggestion that's got nothing to do with your demand which should remain clear. In this way, we, we must speak like, I'm afraid, males who are usually very direct and very clear and not, oh, I'd love you to tidy your room because won't it look nice when Aunt Maud comes to visit? We'll be so proud of it because <laughs> all of that just goes in one ear and out the other. So when you're wanting a message to be clearly understood, it must be direct and clear and offer no options. Thank you, Tanisha, for taking part. <laughs> so to be well understood, sensory blocking and then a very clear message with no alternatives. In a while, we'll talk about what happens if the child disobeys, but not at this moment. <clears throat> the next thing we've got to do is make it positive. Now, in pedagogics, it's known already that if you say what to do, you will double the chances of what you want compared to saying what not to do. So if children are around a pool and you say, don't run, well, it's almost like a red rag to a bull, isn't it? And it's been shown that you have at least a 50% improvement in obeying you if you say walk instead of don't run. The same as you say, come here and do this rather than leave that alone. How many times have I told you? Or start now rather than stop doing that nonsense. So it's being positive has a dramatic increase in the likelihood that the child will do what you want. So our first little set is providing messages that are reasonable, well understood and positive. So let's move on there. And let's provide some structure. So that it's easy for the child to follow your commands. So structure means something like ensuring that the child understands first this, then that, then that. In early childhood, we can even use picture cards to demonstrate it. In general terms, each second one will be a little rest phase. So get dressed, play with your dolls, come to breakfast. And you could use a card system or just words like that, provided you believe the child is developmentally able to take on board those set of three messages. You can make it more complicated as they get older. And we see that in the development of timetables. In preschools, we tend to use picture timetables with a limited amount of information. As children begin school, we begin using word timetables with pictures. And as they progress through school, we increase the complexity of it. So we go from one day to a whole week. So the child can just look at this picture support system and see what they're supposed to do. You can do color coding to help. You can use pictures of the child to help. And all this structure helps the child understand what they should be doing, when they should be doing it, and maybe even for how long they should do it for. So providing some kind of time frame so the child can follow what you want. It should be pointed out that children have a very poor sense of time, even up to eight or nine years of age, as to when yesterday was, when tomorrow is, when next week is. Okay, so that's one form of structure you could use. 
The other wonderful form of structure that people underutilize would be the use of music. Now, music is the most wonderful structured thing. And for example, I bet that if you brought up your favorite song, you could probably recall one or two pages of the uh, stanzas that make up that song. But what about your favorite book? How much of that could you quote for me? There are some very clever people who could manage a quote from the book or maybe the first line, but not the first page. So when we put things into a rhythm, which is this critical part of memory creation that we alluded to initially, then we make it much more retrievable. So for example, children will learn words that they sing before they will be able to say those words. By putting words into a song, it's more memorable. You can put tasks into a song. You can deliberately use songs that the child already knows and put in social messages. Let's just take wheels on the bus. You could make the third paragraph, uh, teacher on the bus says, tidy your toys, as happened to my grandson. And that kind of thing makes things memorable, more easy to retrieve. Mind you, you must use the same first paragraph as usual so the child's memory can find that song that they know. Interestingly, you can build multiple messages or one message at a time through a few different messages using that kind of system. Even if we don't have a song or a message system within it, if you learn something and you've got pleasant music on in the background that's keeping you relaxed, you improve your memory by about 20% for that learning task. And we can make that even better if when tested, we play that same music again. So music is a very powerful thing, both as a background and as a deliberate involvement within the structure to help ch children find the memories that you wish them to, just as the timetable is a way of finding the memory of what should I be doing now. There are other forms of structure, but we're going to skip that just at the moment and, and move on. And we'll have a look now at uh, creativity. Now, creativity means children just having something around them, nothing, nothing formal, nothing structured, not electronic, which is very structured. Maybe just a pile of sticks or some mud or some bits of rag or something else, some boxes, and let them go and make something of it. This is how children develop creativity. And it's been shown that children who are deliberately encouraged into creative roles will have a much better function in school later on, not just in literacy, but in their ability to process information and data and to think of different angles. We do need the more structured learning as well, but we certainly need creativity. And it's been one of the problems with electronics is that children are being restricted from being outdoors, doing creative things of their own initiation that helps them develop these important learning functions. So I'm not going to talk more about creativity now, but it is quite a large topic. The next one we want to talk about is, let's just call it blah, okay? I just said to Danusha before, Go and tidy your room. What if she said back to me, go do it yourself? What would I think of that? Well, my, what I would think of that was that she couldn't think and she just said the first thing that came into her head. Now, one of the reasons she could, couldn't think was because I deliberately did things to her to stop her from thinking, didn't I? I came at her from the front. I make strong eye contact, which strongly blocks thinking. So I need to be able to remove that block so that she can think and come through with a sensible answer. So if I'm thinking of that just as the first silly thing that came into her head, it might be a swear word, it means who do you think you're looking at, something like that. Um, just let it go, let it go. It's just blah, sort of like vomit almost. And in fact, one or two year olds sometimes do use vomit like that or fall on the floor. So it might be an action, it might be words. Just this first response when you can't think, you just do something to shut people up so you can think. And if we think of it like that, then we can let it go. And what we do then is patiently wait without eye contact because that stops children being able to think, especially young children and especially teenage boys, um, although teenage girls aren't that much better. <laughs> and so we can turn away, cross our fingers and wait. Or if they don't move quickly on it, we can pop outside and just, well, I've got to go and do something now, just leave them to think. Now you probably increased your chances by about 50% that they will do what you want, but it does not mean that they will do it. So we can bring other strategies in, such as playing off. So if you ask children to do something and only one does it, well, obviously you're going to focus on that one and explain why that's a big help to you and the family and carry on generally, where not give any response to those who have not moved towards what you want. 
You know what they'll do then, don't you? They'll toss a little storm to see if they can't drag you into their disobedience, which we must also have nothing to do with. We're focused on people now and reinforcing the behaviours that we want rather than those that we do not want. By the way, any of you who are feeling a little bit anxious at the moment about your own children, none of this applies where your family is working well. These are strategies we use when people are struggling with child's be a child's behaviour. So please don't rush off and start doing all these things unless you have a specific problem. Let's do a blower a bit more now because um, I, let's say I ask her to come to tea and she says no. Now what, what I could do would be just to go and start eating tea. And my thought would be when I finish tea, she's finished as well. And so if she came along after tea and said, I'm hungry now, I want my tea now. And my response would be, lovely weather we're having, isn't it? Uh, I, wonder, I wonder if it'll be a better day tomorrow. So not only is the food off in that situation, but the subject's off as well. Because if you talk about it, then the child's had their negativity reinforced again. So blah is something to cut dead. No eye contact, no words, let it go. Um, now if, as I said, we can play children off and we can make sure that when they do obey what we do that we make a big fuss and explain how it's helpful, even if there is a delay. So you've asked for something, they've not done it then, maybe they've done it an hour later. You should respond as normal, they've done it, that's all that counts. Okay, so blah is a very important concept and not a lot of parents know about this and I, I suspect even it's not well taught in schools. Um, and teachers do things at schools like saying sort of, you know, what was the idea of doing that, Shelshire? And of course I couldn't think and so I say, I didn't. And they say, you did, I saw you. And then I say, well, why did you ask me if you saw me? And then, and then don't get smart with me, son. Then I kick them in the shins and suddenly I'm suspended. Now, every day in a school near you, exactly that happens when it needn't happen, because all that happened was that child was blocked from thinking so that they couldn't respond sensibly. Okay, so let's move on now from blah and let's consider engagement. Now, now this is a huge topic and if we want to talk about memory creation, this is one of the areas where information really stands out. So engagement, the idea is, how do I get into a child's head so I can have them interested in the thing I want them to learn. Now this can be found in things like floor time, engagement, you can see YouTube things on floor, floor time and YouTube, it's in the TEACH program. So a lot of teachers are taught about these things and basically it means trying to get into the child's head because you are interested in what they are doing initially. So let's say I had a child who was just sitting doing this and it was going on and on and on, and they were ignoring what I was saying to the others to do, what could I do? Well, if I had the time, I'd come up beside them without looking at them, and I'd just near them, I'd probably do the same thing. And then I'd pause, and I can almost guarantee you they'll reach out and grab my hand and get me to continue. So I've begun an engagement with them. And then I could be a bit silly. change the rhythm, something like that, with a bit of a laugh on the face. So I've got them, in, got them engaged and maybe laughing a bit. And then I could take it further, I could introduce a learning topic like one, two, one, two, one, two, something like that. So, and I've done all that without eye contact, which is too threatening. Or if it's just a child playing on the floor with their Lego, then you could sit and copy what they're doing and then try and be silly. Do it the wrong way so that they can correct you. So, but you're doing it all with a bit of a laugh because if you don't, it'll be taken too seriously. So, and then we're engaging them. And then we can use Lego to give ideas of sharing. So we could have Lego shared between two buildings. Or if you've got the dinosaurs out and you're, you're imitating what they're doing, you're making maybe the wrong sound for T-Rex, you're going meow for T-Rex, something silly, you'll be corrected. But then you could move on to showing how dinosaurs could be nice to each other, could be gentle with each other in play so that you're bringing in a learning task once you have engaged that child, once they are interested in what you're doing. And later on, it's a very powerful learning tool. Letting a child correct you with a smile is a powerful learning tool. As well as that, we've tied it to their interests. So for example, if we have a child in a classroom who refuses to engage with, a, let's say, a mathematical task, and we know they love building Lego, then let's count the Lego blocks as we put them in. They don't want to do writing, 
but they love Thomas the Tank Engine. So let's write with Thomas and let's put our learning task within their interest. So these are just some of the points about engagement. It is a very big topic. If people are interested, we can send you a paper on, on that engagement technique. Uh, to me, it's one of the most important ways of getting a child on board with learning. I suppose that's something as GPs, we, we don't have these tools at our, disposable, uh, at our disposal all the time. So having some kind of structure in terms of giving parents or educators yes. uh, this kind of uh, helpful tips yeah. well, might I, help I, us. Well, I think the starting point is just knowing about them. Yeah. <laughs> so that's why we're doing this today, yeah. of course. But yes, there are teaching materials, but there are also people who can teach it as well. Uh, particularly anyone who's been trained in um, you know, floor time technique um, will know about these techniques. A lot of psychologists have learned it. In fact, a lot of therapists have learned it as well. Occupational therapists regularly use engagement techniques in getting children involved. So there's a number of different services. It's a bit individual about whether individuals in those services have had an interest in, in floor time techniques. So now let's look at a very interesting subject called the serious reputation disorder. So you sidle up to me and you say, Better watch out for Tanusha. She'll hit you soon as look at you. So I walk over near Tanusha and she raises to scratch her head and I say, it's true, I saw it. She raised her hand towards me. And then suddenly we have a, ch a whisper going around that something is true and we're reinforcing it in the person we're interested in. So they actually are doing it more and more. So we make it self-fulfilling. Now we see this very regularly in logbooks with schools and we get in our referrals, for example, we'll get sent 10 pages of everything wrong that a child has done and nothing about anything good that child has done. To me, that implies that people are looking out for bad behaviour. And by looking out for it and recording it, they're going to be reinforcing it and making it self-fulfilling. So things like logbooks and transfer of information from one teacher to the next or one carer to the next should focus on a child's successes, not on their failures, Otherwise, we will build their failures rather than build their successes. And I've seen children destroyed in just a few months through a change of teacher or a change of carer who has looked in for failure instead of looking for success. It's very easy to destroy people by looking for their failure. So serious reputation disorder means undergoing a deliberate effort to record and to pass on and to talk to others about successes a child has. This really matters for children who are coming from backgrounds of emotional injury or, or neglect, um, who are of low self-esteem, who are having learning difficulties. This is a serious problem, especially we see it in children who've got specific disorders like specific writing disorder. So the serious reputation disorder is where we reinforce behaviours that we don't want because we're looking for them and recording them. Um, as as part of this, we might speak briefly about detentions because detentions are a tool commonly used by schools to punish a child for misdemeanors. And in our, in our book, pretty well most of the children we see are made worse by this intervention, not, not made better. Again, it's reinforcing all the failures a child's made. If a teacher instead were to say, I'm going to give you some of my special time tomorrow to work through this problem so that we can fix it, that would be a much, much better strategy, for example. Um, and working in a positive way, not in a negative way, preferably reacting to a good behaviour, not a poor one. What about rewards? Are rewards good or bad? Hmm. Interesting question, isn't it? It depends how it's done is the answer. So, for example, a reward means that you have shown approval of something after it has happened. If you say, if you do this, then that's called a bribe. And we know that bribes are not as effective. So a reward comes out of the blue, it's positive about what's happened, it explains what's happened, and it doesn't matter so much whether there's a monetary or a gift reward in it, what matters is the reaction. So the reaction is important and the, not much so. So for example, if a child has pocket money, you could say, well, on Saturday morning, let's give them $2. 
they always get two dollars on Saturday morning no matter what but let's give bonuses let's say I'm going to give you another 50 cents bonus because on Thursday morning you were ready for school before anybody else because setting up competitions is always good of course um, or on Friday afternoon you looked after your little brother really well just look for things that have happened during the week that represent an effort that that child has made overall we know that if you reward effort not necessarily success within that effort that you'll get a person working to their best if instead you reward children who are not working then they will not try they will not do work for example within the classroom it's much better at the end of a lesson if there are children who've worked children who've done a bit children who've done nothing to go to the child who's worked well say so say why it was good how it worked go to a child who's done a bit and say thanks for trying that was a good effort and then start the next session don't even look at the children who've not contributed. You're putting very powerful pressure on them to toe the line when you do that. But no eye contact, no words. So that's a powerful pressure. So in terms of the serious reputation disorder, that's part of being proactive. And I'm going to separate out the next little bit of this, which is, of course, If carers, and that includes teachers, parents, uh, whether they're actual parents or surrogate parents, looking after themselves. Because if you're not looking after yourself, then you can't manage. When you're in a poor mood, you're going to be much more reactive and react to things that you wish you wouldn't react to. So we, it's important always to have a discussion with parents. What do you do to keep yourself sane? You know, what, are the things, what are the breaks that you take? Oh, I haven't got time for breaks. Well, you haven't got time not to take breaks. Because all of us need breaks to keep our brain in a nice stable environment. If it's just one thing on top of another, on top of another, then we get destabilization. And we see it with some of the electronic media now, which doesn't allow brains to rest at all. So people become very reactive and some people say, oh, they're, they're angry all the time, simply because their brain hasn't had time to relax. And that's just not a lack of sleep. So are they taking breaks? Ask specifically, what do you do to take breaks, to stay on top of all this? Who do you talk to? Where do you go for a walk? You know, how, who do you communicate with? Have you got something at home you do? Take a cup of tea, walk outside, take a break. For example, when husbands get in from work, they really shouldn't deal with children. They should have a break and then deal with children. They should de-stress first. And we find that it works a lot better. Otherwise, whoever's been at work arrives home, they've got all their work stress. If they're engaged straight away with children, they will be reactive and then that will not work. Neither the parent nor the child will be satisfied. Well, we're just going to tidy up now with two topics in one area. And this is about self-regulation, which is our third portion. So we're going to talk about relaxation skills, which we've just been <laughs> alluding to right now. So this is not courses on anger management. That's focusing on the wrong thing. That's giving value to people who are angry. Let's flip it over and let's say, what relaxation training are involved your children in? What breaks do you encourage them to have? What brain, what brain rest periods do they have? Are you giving them a physical technique? Are you showing them how to do deep breathing or a muscle relaxation technique or going and bouncing on the trampoline as ways of settling down? What are you teaching them? So we want to be as a proactive, positive thing about the relaxation skills. In the same, in the same vein, I'm going to go out on a little bit of a limb here and say that I'm very distressed by all the anti-bully campaigns and because they give bullies everything they could ever have wanted. They're getting massive amounts of media attention in the, all forms of media and including social media and it's, it's providing food and drink for that behaviour to continue. What we need to do is focus instead on what does it take to make a friend and to hold a friend. And indeed, for most people who are bullying, they lack these skills. So it's particularly important that they learn it as well. So in friendship skills, we need to know things like how to share, to take turns. And that in includes in conversation. You've said something, give your friend a chance to say something. So we want sharing, turn taking, telling friends nice things about each other rather than telling them about their warts. And we all love it when people say, gee, you're looking nice today. 
Shucks. <laughs> Don't worry, if someone says something's awful, then for the rest of the day we're just a little bit off-key, aren't we, about not having enjoyed it. So we need to teach them to look for good things, good qualities in their friends and their peers that they can reinforce. So we'd be wanting them to know what to do if their friends say silly things. So, for example, if Tanusha said to me, you're, you're big and fat and ugly, then I'd say, oh, thanks, Tanusha, that's so kind of you. Um, instead of saying, can you just agree. So a deep breath, so you get rid of the tension, smile to trick the enemy into thinking what on earth is happening now, and then just agree with them. In other words, you take all the energy out of, out of that argument. Okay, well today we've focused on the general rules of behavior. We do have a document based on this that we can circulate that's got the same information in a rather more structured way perhaps that you're very welcome to have. In essence, we've talked about what do we do in a reactive way when children say or do things that we disapprove of. We need to know to anticipate storms and switches. But more importantly, we need to know how to be proactive, to give children space to think, to be clear in our directions, to understand that we need to build their strengths and not their weaknesses, and then to teach them those self-management skills long term. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Um, well, I just want to say that I've learned so much sitting in your clinics ex exactly about this concept of building rather than breaking down and, and being strengths-focused, which I think is a lot, which, which works, uh, yeah. which I've seen, you know, uh, it does work. I've modified my own parenting uh, based on that. Uh, yes, uh -huh. it, it even works in learning school. If, if people focus on what's right and why it's right and speak only about that, a child will progress faster with their learning than if their errors are pointed out. <laughs> that, that whole uh, concept of errorless teaching as well. Hmm. Um, so I suppose the next session uh, in two weeks is really focusing on uh, differential diagnosis and relevant assessment tools that we in primary care can use in our primary care setting, so what resources we can actually access within the primary care setting. And indeed as part of that, uh, some idea about what the different therapists would actually do for a child with a speech disability or who's low tone or who's got one of these specialist um, problems that are part of these neurodevelopmental disorders. Because what we'll find out next week is that very few children are exactly in line with any of these diagnostic categories. Most children have considerable overlaps, mm -hmm. Many can't be fitted into anyone clearly, despite despite a lot of pressure to try to do so. So I think we've been really uh, we've really kept a time here, Ian. So thank you again. Um, I haven't seen any questions come up, but certainly you're welcome to contact us at the PHN for any questions. And uh, we're we'll send a questionnaire out as well, a survey, just to see if there's any other topics that you'd like Ian to um, you know uh, go over while, while we have access to you. Um, and yeah, we're hoping that everyone can join us in two weeks as well. Thank you, Ian. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Nusha. Thank you all. Thank you for attending.